Okay, hi. My name is uh, Jimmy Lin. I work here at Google, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Alice O. Oh. Uh, she's an assistant professor of computer science at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, professor O's group does uh, research in natural language processing, machine learning, and human-computer interaction. And today she'll be talking about the work that her group is doing on topic models on, uh, related to online news and reviews. Okay, I'm uh, very glad to be here, and thank you, Jimmy, for hosting this talk. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about topic models and how we um, apply that to online reviews and online news. And um, in doing so, um, I'm going to be talking about topic models a little bit just to um, make sure that everybody knows what topic models are. So it'll be a brief introduction to it. Um, and then I'll go into the details of our work. Um, these are sort of two mini talks. The topics are, the, um, the second and the third items are related, but they're not quite the same. And these are um, from two papers that my students and I uh, recently submitted to uh, Wisdom next year. So keep my fingers crossed. Okay, so um, let's just dive into um, uh, the main problem that we're going to be talking about. And um, recently, Google Books has announced this, right? I'm sure many of you um, read about this somewhere, that um, Google Books has counted at least uh, 130 million books out there ever written, and I'm sure there are more. So what we can see, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, is that there is a lot of text data out there to be um, to be understood, right? So if you have 130 million books, we can ask this question. It's a very simple question when you just look at it. What are the books about? But it's a very challenging problem, right? So if, if you know anything about text processing, you'll agree with me that if we have 130 million books and we're trying to figure out what actually is in those books, um, that's a very difficult question. Um, topic models is one answer, one approach to getting at that answer, okay? So the plate diagram up there is what you normally see when we talk, when we talk about topic models, so I just put it up there. Um, we'll get back to the plate diagram in a little bit. But topping models, the main purpose of them is to um, understand, sorry, to understand and uncover the underlying semantic structure of text of your corpus. Okay. So let's look at an example of what a topic model could do for you. Right. So this is um, an article from the New York Times a couple days ago, a few days ago. And um, the title is Economic Slowdown Catches Up with NASCAR. And as you can see from the headlines, it's talking about the NASCAR car racing. And it's also talking about the economic recession. And um, what topic models do for you is um, it kind of discovers, it uncovers what the latent topics are in an article or in a, in a corpus. Okay, so. You can see in these three colors here, green, orange, and little, uh, I guess, purplish pink color, um, the three topics, three of the main topics that you can see from the article. So the green one is about NASCAR races, and you can see sort of throughout the document, I've ha highlighted the words that are um, about that topic. Okay, so NASCAR races, track, raceway, cars, et cetera. And then um, the same thing with orange is about economic recession. So you would see um, words like sales, costs, so on. And um, the purple is the general sports talk. So um, the intuition topping models and the assumption that a, a topping model would have, it, every art, every document is made up of multiple topics. And the, to the words in the document are generated from those multiple topics. Okay, so. LDA, the latent Dirichlet allocation, is one of the simplest topic models, and it's very widely used. So, um, and uh, it's a generative model, which means that it tries to mimic 
uh, what the writing process is, right? So it tries to generate a document given um, the topics. Okay, so let's see how that works. So bear with me if you are experts on LDA. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you are. Um, so here again, we start with the three topics, the NASCAR races, economic recession, and, um, and the general sports topic. And when you have those topics, and, and notice the topics are um, made up of words, and I'm, I'm just showing you a subset of the words that have high probabilities in that topic, um, but actually the topics are multinomials over the entire vocabulary. So the um, NASCAR race topic, it, has, um, it gives high probabilities to those words, but there are other words in that topic, and they have small probabilities. Okay, so when you have these uh, multinomials over, over words, um, when you want to, say, generate three documents um, from these three topics, what you would do is kind of um, produce or kind of guess these topic distributions of the documents that you're trying to generate. So, for example, um, the, uh, the, the, middle, the one in the middle, the writer is thinking, you know, I'm going to write mostly about the general sports topic, and then I'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the other topics, okay? That's what the big um, purple bar means. Okay, so when you have those topic distributions, distributions, then what you can do is, uh, oops, I'm going backwards. Okay, so from, from say, that um, the bottom topic distribution, you can generate the words according to that distribution. So since we have a lot of the green, um, you would see many green words popping up there, okay? And then the same thing you would do for the other documents. So that's the generative process of an LDA. Okay, so let's look at it from the plate diagram perspective. So here up, up on the left is the general, um, is the uh, widely used plate diagram for this. And what you can see here is the, um, the phi's, okay, uh, next to the beta there, are um, the topics, and those, which are the multinomials over the vocabulary. And then, um, and then up there, up to the right corner over there, are the thetas, which are the topic distributions. Okay? And then from those topic distributions, um, if you want to generate one document, you would generate sort of the, the set of rectangles I have over there, which are the words, or which are the topics of the words that you're going to write in your document, okay? So, um, so in this example, I'm, I'm looking at the first topic distribution, and I've sort of picked out the topics that I want to write about. And then if, when you have those topics, then you can look up the multinomial topics um, over here to generate, to actually come up with the words, okay? According, so for example, the first word um, you're going to write is an orange. So you're going to come here and look at the orange topic and say, okay, these words have high, prob high probabilities in this topic, so I'm going to pick one, one of those words, okay? So, so that's what you get um, in the actual, uh, the, the rectangle down below, um, where you actually have the words in your document, okay? And that's how the document is generated. Okay, but in reality, what, uh, what you have is that you only observe the words. So these are the documents in your corpus, okay? So, um, or this is one document in your corpus, and all others, like the topic distributions, the topics themselves, they're latent. We, we, don't, we don't know them. But the, um, the purpose of fitting the model, then, is to come up with those topic distributions and the topics, OK? So they, all those others must be discovered by the model. OK, so that's what you do when you, you know, fit an LDA. OK, so what does an output of an LDA look like? Um, they look something like this. Um, there are some other outputs that LDA gives you, but um, one of the major outputs of LDA is uh, these multinomials over words, which are, which are the topics. So the NASCAR topic, for example, has those words with high probabilities. Um, what I put at the very bottom row is to let you know that actually um, every topic has every word in the vocabulary. It's just that some, like the money word here in the NASCAR topic has very low probability. Um, in, in actuality, it's probably much lower than that, okay? So um, that's what the topics look like. 
So if we go back to the, um, the question I posed earlier, if you have 130 million books and you want to answer the question, what are the books about, then um, you can imagine you, uh, you can sort of feed these books into an LDA to discover topics. Right? So if you um, represent one book as one document and you run it over 130 million of them, you can discover the underlying topics, the underlying semantic structure of your corpus. Um, let's, let's look at a smaller um, problem, since it's very hard to run LDA on 130 million documents. Um, but if we have news articles, and we have about 200,000 of them over the last 12 months, then we can ask the question, what are the, what are the news articles about? And this is something that we can um, try to solve. And um, one difference here is that time is a very important dimension here, right? Because news is inherently sequential and temporal, and you want to know what happened when and how long did it last and so on, okay? So we need something um, that considers time. Okay, so we propose uh, what we call topic chains, uh, which is has the main purpose of uncovering the underlying semantic structure of a, sequ of a sequential corpus of news. Okay. And this is um, work that my student did mostly. Um, and so if you have uh, any detailed questions about it, you can send him an email, <laughs> although I'll try to answer most of them. By the way, if you have any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand and ask. OK, so let's look at what what we have, what kind of tools that we have available to us now. So if you look at um, the New York Times, if you kind of scroll down to the bottom half of the page, um, this is what you get. You get a quick uh, news at a glance type of a thing, right? So you can look at the New York Times, the front page of that website, and kind of figure out what's been going on in the last couple of days, okay? In terms of uh, technology, wor the world, um, business, arts, and so on. And this is a very good um, view, and I, 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 love, I love to look at it, but this, um, as you can imagine, takes a lot of intelligence and a lot of work, right? So this is a pr product of you know, intelligent New York Times editors out there. Um, who are trying, who are putting this together. And plus, um, it doesn't have the dimension of time because this is a snapshot of the news, right? So um, here at Google, uh, somebody has made this um, really interesting uh, tool. It's called Google News Timeline. Um, it's still in the Google Labs, so you may not you may or may not know, but this is where you can look at um, the sequential um, issues and events, right? So um, right now it's showing the monthly view, so you can see what was the more, most important news in March of 2009, and so on. And you can search, too, so you, if you search for um, a certain keyword, then you would get articles that are about that keyword. Right. And you can look at the weekly view and the yearly view as well, I think, and the daily, of course. So this is pretty cool. But I think that um, here we still have some questions that uh, are unresolved. For example, um, if you have an article, say there's an, an important article in March of 2009. Are there similar articles that follow that are talking about the same thing in April 2009, perhaps a couple or few months later, right? And if there are similar articles talking about the same topic over a long period of time, how long is that period of time? How long did that topic last, right? And um, if it's a long-lasting topic, then is it part of a general sort of professional topic like the U.S. economy, or was it part of a long-running sort of um, event or issue such as the H1N1 issue, right? Or was it part of a, a very short temporary topic um, such as uh, the death of Michael Jackson, okay? So we would like to know those things when we look at the articles, but um, at least what we saw in the previous slide didn't really show that. And if it's, uh, if it's a general sort of long-running topic, 
um, like the H1N1, for example, um, the topic itself kind, kind of evolves through the nine months or how many, however many months that it lasts. Okay, first it was talking about the outbreak. Um, perhaps maybe it was talking about travel restrictions and then vaccinations, deaths, um, schools, and so on. Okay, so we would like to see how the same topic evolves through time. So what we propose is something like this. Um, this is uh, a part of um, our results, is that you can look at um, several months of news and kind of look at the topics and how they're clustered together in what we call topic chains. So you, you, here you see that there's a topic chain about labor unions, education, um, the war in Afghanistan. Um, the swine flu, and so on. And then you would see some events, like there was um, a terror in Hong Kong or, or something like that, and the, um, the death of Michael Jackson. So we produce something like this, where you can see the general perpetual topics, um, you can see the long-running topics, and then you can see sort of the temporary events that happen. Um, so, so this is what we call the topic chains, and um, this is the plan that we had to do something like that, right? So what we did is um, we took a bunch of articles over a bunch of months, and we divide the corpus into time slices, and we just chose the time slice of 10 days each, okay? And um, for each time slice, you would have a bunch of articles, right? And we can find the topics using just the simple L LDA. And when you have the topics from the LDA, then you can try to match them up to see which topics are similar, okay? And when you have the similar topics, you can sort of link them up into um, topic chains. And once you, yeah. Yeah, so I'll talk, to, I'll talk about similarity metrics in, a, in the next slide, I think, <laughs> or a couple of slides. Um, and then once we have the topic chains, we can identify which are the long topics, which, which are the short topics, and within the long topics, we can sort of see what the topic evolution looks like. Okay, so let me talk now about sort of each of those steps, except for the first one, because that one is trivial. So um, we worked with the corpus of uh, nine months of news in Korea. So we took the th websites of three major newspapers and collected documents, articles from all of them. Um, the corpus looks like that, 130,000 articles, um, 140,000 unique words, um, named entities, and we, uh, we chose 50 as the top, the number of topics per each time slice for a total of 1,400 uh, topics. And um, let me just show you uh, the results of the LDA, uh, finding topics using LDA. And there's, since there's 1,400 of them, I can't really show you them all, but um, I'm just showing you four examples of how the topics turned out pretty good. Um, the first one you can see is about sports. The second one is about business, and then um, about smartphones and technology. Um, and the last thing, last topic is about academia. So when we have those topics, we can construct topic chains like this, where you look for similar topics within certain window size. And um, we also, I'll show you an experiment that we did with um, increasing or decreasing the window size and what happens there. But what it means is, do you look at only the time slice before, or how many time slices do you go back to find the similar topics? Okay, so here comes um, the answer to that question, measuring similarity. Um, this was kind of an important issue because uh, the major thing about topic chains is that we're um, finding similar topics, right? So um, remember the topics look like those which are multinomials over words. And so you can imagine um, various ways to measure similarity. And in, within the topic modeling research community, people have used um, most of these metrics um, most notably, they usually use KL divergence or, or cosine similar, cosine, yeah, cosine similarity, and um, and I've kind of categorized these six 
um, or is it six or five? No, six um, similarity metrics uh, by how each metric looks at the topics. Okay, so the first thing you can look at, or, or I said that a topic is a multinomial over the vocabulary, right? So if you have two probability di distributions and you want to measure the distance, then KL divergence is the answer, right? Or um, JS divergence, which is the symmetric version of KL divergence, okay? Or you can look at a topic as a vector uh, where each dimension is a probability of the word in the topic. So if you take that view, then you can use cosine similarity because to measure the distance between two vectors, right? Or you can use Kendall's tau if you look at a topic as a list of ranked words, a, a ranked list of words. So if, if we just ignore the probabilities, but just look at, you know, NASCAR is the first rank and so on, then we can use Kendall's tau or DCG, which is used, I guess, a lot in information retrieval. And then lastly, um, if you look at only the subset of words that have top high probabilities, then we can um, look at the intersection and unions of sets, which we can measure with um, Descartes' coefficient. So we wanted to test these metrics to see which would be the most or the best performing um, similarity metric. Okay. So what we did is this. Um, we computed the log likelihood of data of, of the corpus given um, the topics that LDA found. Uh, what that means is, if um, if you have uh, if you have a small um, negative log likelihood of data given the topics, then that means your topics are explaining your corpus very well. Okay, so the higher the value. Um, there's sort of a mismatch between your topics and, um, and your corpus, okay? So it's kind of like perplexity, too. Oh. Um, so what we did is we took an original set of 50 topics that LDA found for each, for, for one time slice, and re replaced five of those topics with similar topics that are found by each of the metrics, each of the six metrics. Okay, so um, for example, you know, if, if KL divergence says um, among these 50 topics and then another set of 50 topics in the next time slice, um, these five are the most similar pairs, then we replace um, the topics from the second time slice and kind of put them in the first time slice. So you would have the 45 of the original topics plus five new ones that KL says is most similar or most similar. Okay, so, so then when we compute the um, log likelihood of the modified topics, or the log likelihood of the data given the modified set of topics, then um, we can see which of the similarity metrics found the most similar topics. Okay, so um, as I said before, KL divergence and cosine similarity are uh, most often used similarity metrics. And we found that JS divergence actually performs a little bit better. And um, the, uh, the asterisks next to the metrics um, mean that um, there's a significant difference, statistically significant difference between um, that metric and JS divergence. And um, Jacquard's coefficient performs pretty well, too, but uh, we didn't use that because you have to have this per, um, parameter. There's a uh, parameter that we had to set, and we thought that that's probably not as general as just using JS divergence with no parameter. So that's what we chose to use a, as our similarity metric for constructing the topic chains. And let's now talk about the size of the window, size of the sliding window. So if we can take the Markov assumption and just look back one time slice to find the similar topics, but then you wouldn't find that, that case of sort of the long arrow over there, where a topic uh, was kind of an important issue for a while, and then it kind of disappears for a few weeks and then comes back again. So we didn't, we didn't want to miss that um, similarity uh, chain there. So um, this is what we did as the experiment to see how the sliding window size affects the resulting topic chains. So um, up at the very top is uh, 
a set of topic chains found when we use the sliding window of size one, looking back just one time cycle. And then at the bottom is the sliding window of size six. So um, it's kind of an obvious result, but um, you can see when you're looking back only one time slice, then the topic chains are kind of fragmented and they're kind of dispersed all over the place. Um, but as you increase the window size, then um, the topic chains over there that had sort of a, a little gap at the middle, in the middle, and then um, continued a few weeks later, they kind of merged together, right? So the topic chains become larger, longer, and you would find these pretty large topic chains at the bottom. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at the middle one um, where there are two major ones and then they come together at the size of five, um, those topic chains are uh, about technology and business. So one of them is about the technology itself, sort of manufacturing, research, development type of topics. And then the other one is sort of the business side of the technology. Okay, so you can see that they kind of merge together at the window size of five. And um, it's kind of hard to interpret that in terms of um, what it means for the user, right? So if the user wants those to be kind of separately um, separate, then that's probably what we should do. But if you want them to be sort of in this same topic chain, then you might want to go with a larger larger um, window size. But in general, um, as you increase the size of the, of the sliding window, um, the topic chains tend to become more abstract. So at the end, you would have something that's similar to like the sections in your newspaper, right? So business, um, life and you know culture and you know um, uh, the world news and so on right um, whereas sort of in the middle you would have sort of more concrete topics okay so that's what that shows um, let's look a little bit closer at the chains themselves what what they mean so if we look at um, the long chains for example um, the swine flu chain right you want to know more than just that there was this big chain of swine flu, and we can see that you know in in 2009 it was kind of a big issue for most of the year. Um, we want to know how that topic actually changed. Okay, so as I talked about before, um, first it was talking about the out outbreak and then vaccinations and so on. Right, so we call those. Um, focus shifts. So within a topic chain, we can look at how the focus shifts in, um, in the chain. And I apologize for the small font. It's, it's really hard to see. Um, but this topic chain is about um, automobile uh, industry. Okay. So I'll just read you. Uh, topic number one uh, has the top words automobiles, Vietnam, Kia, motors, vehicle, and sales. And topic number three, which is right below that, is um, develop technology, automobile investment, and industry. Okay? And then the, the other topics are pretty similar to that. So you really can't tell what is going on just by looking at the topics themselves. Okay, so what we wanted to do is look at words that change the most between two similar topics. So what happened between this topic and the next topic? And if we look at the words that are not common but are most different among the two topics, then you can sort of figure out what what's been going on. And on top of that, we looked at just the named entities. Named entities are things like um, names of organizations, names of people, um, sort of specific things like that, because a lot of the news, a lot of the events that happen in the news are about specific people or organizations and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> coming, going from um, number one to number three again, um, when we do that, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the named entities that we find are, um, uh, green, solar, um, Japan, energy, and what's the last? And carbon. <laughs> yeah. So, so that that tells you that there was something going on um, in the in the second. So those are the 
the words that changed, that increased the most in probability from topic number one to topic number three. And we, if we just go back and look at the headlines, you see that um, there, was, there were a few headlines that are talking about um, Japanese car makers like Toyota um, coming up with solar powered cars. Okay, so, so if we look at this sort of close, close up view of the topic chains and the named entities that change, um, then we can have a much deeper understanding of the, of the evolution of the topics. Okay, now um, let's look at the uh, short chains. And this is pretty interesting. Um, here, every line is a topic, and the left column is the date, so um, 0P07 means um, the first 10 days of July in 2009. There was, um, there was a missile launch. There was a discussion over the North Korea missile launch. And then the next line talks about the death of Michael Jackson, and then some milk scandal, um, and then some heightened a topic about heightened security at the end of the year, and then some romance over you know, entertainment people. Um, in April, of two th April is when Korea has Arbor Day, so talk talking about trees and stuff like that. And then the last topic is kind of interesting. Um, Obama, Republicans, Jeju Island is an island in Korea that's used for resorts and playing golf. And you, you see golf and Tiger Woods, but um, it, I don't know if Obama went there to play golf or not, <laughs> with, with Tiger Woods maybe. But what we can interpret that is um, that LDA found a topic that's kind of not about a single topic. And LDA often does that. <laughs> if you've ever run um, LDA or any other topic models, oops, um, you'll find many of, or some of the results, some of the topics that you find are not really coherent. So anyway, um, these are short topic chains, which means they're like two or three um, topics, or even one, two or three topics. And um, they represent mostly temporal events, um, temporal issues, or they could be um, about inco incoherent topics. And you can kind of see how, if it's a coherent topic, then it would e more easily find similar topics in the ne next time window, right? OK, so that's actually um, the end of the topic chains part of the talk. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> OK, um, I'll, I'll go quickly over the next topic. Um, so we proposed topic chains, which is a framework based on very simple LDA um, to understand what's going on in the news corpus. OK, now let me switch gears and talk about sentiment and aspects in reviews. So um, the. The model is called Aspect Sentiment Unification Model. And um, its main purpose is to uncover the structure of aspects and sentiments in a review. Okay, And this is another student of mine who worked on this, mostly. And um, the problem is this. If you go to Amazon, this is um, a review of a digital camera. It's a very long review. It's like, uh, it's like a conference paper, almost. And this is actually not the end. There's more. <laughs> um, but it's a very you know, detailed review. He talks about, or this user talks about, a lot of good things and bad things about this camera. And we want to do something like this, right? Amazon does um, sort of aspect or attribute-based um, sentiment analysis of the review. So in addition to the general, how many, how many stars did this camera get, it also um, gives you how many, pic how many stars for the picture quality and so on. Um, the way Amazon does it, I, I don't know exactly how they do it, but I noticed that, uh, so this is a camera with lots and lots of reviews, like 300 reviews or so. And then there's um, the same Canon digital camera, certain other models which have very few reviews. And for those, we, we actually don't have these attributes. So it looks like there's some, some manual work and some automated um, way of looking at what the attributes are. And we call those attributes um, aspects. And they're things like this. Um, this thing is small and it's light, starts up and turns off fast. Um, the low light performance is best. And, and so these are actual sentences from the reviews. Um, and the sentiment 
is, is something like this. The, the words highlighted in pink are the ones that carry sentiment for this, for um, each sentence. Okay, so let's look a little bit closely at um, what these sentiment words are. Okay, some of them are um, general sort of affective words that express emotion like love, I love this, I'm satisfied, I'm dissatisfied, I'm disappointed. Okay, and then some of the other ones are general um, sentiment words like best, excellent, bad. They're, they evaluate the quality of something, but they're just general. If something is best, then it's best no matter if it's a coffee maker or a chair, right? Um, and then there are aspect-specific evaluative words, and this is a little bit more fine-grained than domain-specific evaluative words. So let me show you what I mean. Um, in the camera domain, okay, if you say this camera is small, it's probably a good thing. The LCD is small, it's probably a bad thing, right? If you're in the restaurant domain, the beer was cold, is good, pizza was cold, is bad. And the wine list is long, is good, and the wait is long, is bad. So um, beyond the domain, right, we need to go sort of down to each aspect of the review and say whether the sentiment word there expresses positive or negative sentiment. Okay, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, we're trying to discover the aspects automatically as well as the sentiment and the words that carry the sentiment. So to do that, um, we made two models. One is called sentence LDA. Um, the other is called aspect sentiment unification model. And um, we worked with two uh, types of corp corpora. The first one was Amazon reviews. And we took seven product categories, including um, digital cameras, coffee makers, I think um, heaters, and th things like that. They're just pretty different electronic um, products. Oops. And, um, and we also looked at uh, the Yelp restaurant reviews, uh, over four cities and 320 restaurants. And on average, each review had 12 sentences. And our observation starts again with the same set of sentences. Um, what we noticed here is that for many of the sentences in the reviews, one sentence describes only one aspect, okay? And this is different from the general LDA assumption, which is that each word in the corpus, each word in the document represents or is generated from one topic, or if you apply it to aspects, um, one aspect. Okay, so we wanted to make this um, sentence LDA. Um, if you notice, the only difference is the box around the W circle. Okay, so what that means is um, the words and N is the number of words in your document, so each word is generated, um, but Z, which are the topics, are over um, M, which is the number of sentences, okay? So we're saying there are only M aspects in the document, which is the number of sentences in that review, okay? And each sentence has one topic or one aspect. Okay, so that's the basic difference between LDNA and SLDA. And what we found is that when we run SLDA over um, our, our data, um, so this is, um, oh, this, yeah, the results from both uh, the Amazon reviews and the last one actually is from the restaurant review. So remember, we, um, we ran SLDA over all sort of seven categories of electronics um, reviews. And we get these um, aspects that are similar to what we saw earlier in the Amazon attribute categories. Okay, so the portability, um, quality of photo, and ease of use, those are the three in the camera product. And then um, if you look at the laptop reviews, um, the first one is about software and OS, and then the second one is about hardware and so on. And um, some, and what we found when we compared the results of LDA versus SLDA is that LDA, uh, SLDA was finding more product-specific aspects. Okay. Um, for example, the last one, uh, liquors category, liquors topic or aspect, is um, was not found by LDA. It's, instead, the words like beer and wine. Um, and martini was actually one of the top words too. Um, they were kind of spread out 
over different topics, like wine was maybe with the Italian food aspect and so on. So I think it's um, important to notice that LC SLDA, because of that one difference in the assumption it makes, um, finds better product-specific aspects details of the reviews. Okay, we then um, took SLDA and extended it to form a joint model over aspects and sentiments. Okay, so um, the right side of the model, which has the gamma, um, the pi, and the S, so S is the sentiment, and you can see that word is now generated from a pair of sentiment and aspect. Okay, so, um, with this joint model, then if we run it over the corpus, um, without using the labels, any labels of the, of the corpus um, of the documents, we can automatically discover the aspects and the sentiments. Okay, but we do s use seed words. <laughs> um, we took uh, Turney's paradigm words, um, these are kind of uh, generic paradigm sort of sentiment words that a lot of people use, um, like good and nice and bad and nasty. And then, uh, so that was one set of seed words we used. We also um, augmented the paradigm words a little bit with um, other sort of general um, sentiment words that we found from the corpus, okay? So, um, and what we do with, this, with these sentiment words that are a little bit different from other prior work in this joint modeling of sentiment and aspect is that we build the seed words right into the model by, um, playing with the priors of the LDA, okay? So um, setting asymmetric priors and um, initializing give sampling, which is an inference algorithm, um, to, to kind of play with the seed words, okay? And I'll, let me explain that a little bit better here, although um, I, I didn't even talk about give sampling, so, <laughs> so um, if you want to explain that, we can talk uh, later after the talk. So um, beta is the, um, prior for the Dirichlet uh, distribution over the phi's, okay? And what that means is, um, do we start with a uniform distribution of betas, which means that every distribution is equally likely? If we play with the um, betas and do asymmetric um, priors, then we're saying some of the distribution, distributions are more likely than others. Okay, um, so, so what we do, um, what we did with SLDA is we just used the uniform priors. Um, what we do with the betas here is we set zero, beta to zero for any negative sentiment seed words in the other, in the opposite, in the positive sentiments, okay? That means, um, and when we do vice versa for, for the negative, for, for the positive sentiment seed words, okay? That means if you have a positive seed word like good, then it's not going to um, be assigned a non-zero probability in a negative sentiment, um, negative aspect sentiment, okay? Um, and also we uh, start gives sampling, we initialize the give sampling um, by setting the positive seed words to have positive sentiment and the negative seed words to have negative s sentiment. So that's opposed to randomly assigning sentiment, which is what we usually do for give sampling. Okay, so the combination of, of those two um, makes the seed words kind of right into the model without, um, without fidgeting anymore with the words themselves. Okay, so... Um, so these are senti aspects discovered by awesome, as we call the model. Um, and uh, these, so every um, multinomial now is, um, so every word in the multinomial is generated either by the sentiment or by the aspect, or actually jointly by the pair sentiment and aspect. Okay, so um, Interesting results here, like the meat senti aspects here, meat positive and meat negative, the meat aspect was not found by SLDA. So what this tells you is that for some senti aspects, um, if there's strong sort of sentiment correlated with that aspect, then it comes out better with the awesome model than it does for just SLDA without sentiment built in. So. Um, so in original SLDA, what happens is the meat aspect is kind of scattered around again in, you know, in pizza, in burgers, steak, right? Those, 
those aspects have meat words in them. But because we've forced kind of the sentiment to play a bigger role um, in finding the aspects, we see um, aspects like that. And um, an interesting case that we see with payment is that we only get a negative aspect for payment. We don't get a positive sentiment aspect for payment. It's the same thing with parking, too. Um, what that tells us, just an interesting bit, is that people complain about payment not, not being able to use the credit card, or they complain about parking situations. But if they have some satisfaction with it, they don't really write it in the reviews. OK. And the yummy aspect is kind of funny, too. The last word is funny, right? So, um, so that aspect is something that LDA doesn't really find. OK. So let me go on. Um, so what we can do with these topics, okay, the words and the topics, is then we can try to figure out which are the sentiment words and which are the aspect words, right? So if we have the two meet senti aspect words, we can look at the words that appear common across the two sentiments, like meat and um, I don't know what else, uh, sauce, I think. And we say those are the common sort of aspect words for the meat category, okay? Whereas um, things like crispy or bland um, are the sentiment carrying words for that aspect. Okay? So, so those are the aspect specific sentiment words. And so what we do we, is we align um, the top, the senti aspects uh, with uh, the similar aspects again. And then we look at the positive aspects, the negative aspects, and we look at the common words and the words that have a lot of difference in them to figure out things like this. The screen aspect, the words, the common words are like screen, glossy, LCD. And then the sentiment words are bright, um, clear. Those are the positive words. And like reflect, glare. MacBook, obviously, doesn't have a good screen. so. Um, or apparently, I don't, I don't agree with that <laughs> personally. But anyway, so that's what we can do with those topics. Okay. Um, let's look at some other results of this. So here is a result that shows you that sentiment classification per sentence is done pretty well. So, um, we, for, so these are two reviews. The first one is about um, a coffee maker, and then the second one is about a restaurant. And you can see in green, those are the positive sentiment sentences. So that's what the model um, found as the positive sentences, and the ones in pink are the, what the model found them to be negative. And um, of course, I'm going to show you good examples, but most of the examples are pretty good. Okay, so another set of results we can do, we can look at is how well are the aspects assigned to the sentences, right? So these are four different reviews where um, the same aspect was found, um, the aspect, the senti aspect of parking and the negative sentiment. And you can see parking is only validated for three hours and so on. So those are, and um, these came out pretty, pretty well, right? Um, here's another example. Um, some, some of these things, like very convenient, how the model find, found that to be coffee maker easy. <laughs> um, it could be some, I don't know, it, it, it's probably just because um, convenient is up there as one of the top probability words for that senti aspect. Um, some of the other shorter sentences this model has trouble with because there's not enough clue. Okay. But, um, and, and, and I do like to show some of the bad examples as well. So the second one, it took us several uses to understand how much coffee to use. That's obviously not a positive sentiment, but the model classified it as that. Um, but you know, one out of five is not bad, right? Okay, so those are the senti aspects assigned to sentences that we can see. Oh, and the last one I put in there um, to show you that our assumption that one sentence carries one aspect may not always be true, right? So the last sentence is talking about how nice it looks and how easy it is to use. And you can kind of say, you know, are they the same thing or not? I, I, I don't think they're really the same thing. Um, nice looking is probably, or it should be another aspect, sort of the design aspect of the product. And then the ease, ease of use is um, the usability of the product, right? So uh, we do see a lot of sentences in our corpus that do not, um, validate our assumption that 
of one sentence equals one aspect, or even one sentence, one, one sentiment. But, um, so that's future work for us, right, to, to, um, to deal with sentences like that. Okay, um, so uh, all of these that I've, sh the results that I've showed you, um, because of the way topic models, you know, they produce these topics, um, it's really hard to evaluate them. There's really no good way to quantitatively evaluate the aspects. So we can't ask users to go through 20,000 reviews and find all the aspects and kind of compare them against our results, right, or the sentiment. So the sentiment would be a little bit easier to do. So what we did with sentiment, actually, is um, we quantitatively measured how sentiment classification is done against other generative models that jointly model sentiment and aspect together. And um, so, so this is, I have to tell you though, so these R model, as well as these other models, JST and TSM are the two models that we're comparing against. They're all not designed for sentiment classification per se. So they're all trying to discover aspects and sentiments together and come up with these sentiment words and so on. They're not, you know, models to do classification. And neither is ours. But um, we put this experiment in there to show at least that sentiments are found well, okay? So um, let me explain the different things. Um, awesome, the, the blue, is uh, our model with the regular paradigm words. I think there's like a dozen of the paradigm words that I showed you. Awesome plus is the paradigm plus words, the augmented list of words. And then JST plus and TSM plus, we also, they also use seed words, so we use the same set of paradigm plus words. And um, we implemented those two models um, and ran classification over our, our own corpus to see how, they, how well they perform. So you can see the red line, which is awesome plus, performs the best. Um, the next one is the blue, with, so awesome without the paradigm plus words. And then um, the other models don't perform as well on, on the classification task. So, um, so just to tell you, these models are pretty similar to ours. Um, they both don't have the one sentence, one aspect assumption built in. Um, they don't use the seed words right into the model. They do something else with the seed words. Um, so those are sort of the main differences, um, I would say, between those two models and our model. Okay, so um, let me just wrap up. I think time is probably up too. Uh, I just talked about SL SLDA and Awesome, which are the two models, um, extensions of the basic LDA to discover sentiment and aspect together. And we discovered that um, the specific aspects that we found were pretty well aligned with the details of the reviews that people actually write. And we can, um, by looking at the topics and the words within the topics, we can learn um, aspect-specific sentiment words. And lastly, um, we just tested with sentiment classification and, and found that it performs pretty well, okay? So um, just to wrap up now, really, um, topic chains and awesome are the two things that I've talked about. And um, they both work with LDA, right? So they're on different, domains, the one is on the news domain and then the other one is in the reviews domain, um, where we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to uncover what is latent, what is the hidden semantic structure within the news corpus and within the reviews com co corpus. So if you're interested in our work, um, further discussions with me and my students, please um, send us email or you can look at our website to see what the latest things are going on. Okay, thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. Could you comment on um, what you discovered when you ran these through books? Like you were mentioning the Yay. 130 million books. Yeah, yeah. Books so are we didn't. A lot different we haven't than, done that. <laughs> we haven't done that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, I should ask Google Books to uh, do that for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I can't imagine what the results would be. One thing about LDA, though, is that and topping models in general is that they are very computationally expensive. 
as you can imagine, right? You, if as the document size grows large, the number of vocabulary, unique vocabulary grows large, and you're doing Gibbs sampling over all your vocabulary at each iteration, and you have to do thousands of iterations to converge. So the inference part is difficult, and we would like to maybe use Google and you know use distributed computing and all that to um, to figure out how to do that. So the aspects you found usually seems not the ones defined by users, like the camera. Is there any way you can specify, OK, I like to find those aspects specified by users? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we are, we are thinking about it. We haven't done anything. I don't know how to do it. Sort of like the sentiment seed words. You can have maybe seed words for aspects, too, to say, I want to find these aspects. Um, Good question and a, a good idea for an extension of this work. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Thank you.